Welcome to The Detour. I'm Adam Davis. The military is a big part of American life. We spend a lot of money on our military. We see ourselves and our nation occupying a certain place and status in the world due to the strength and size of our military. And we have adopted the widespread practice of thanking people, often performatively, at events large and small for their military service. But fewer than 1% of American citizens are active military personnel, and only about 7% of living Americans have served in the military. Look a little deeper into these numbers, and you see that about 13.5% of men and about 1.5% of women have served. And however much we valorize and conspicuously thank people for their service, we rarely seem to ask about, listen to, or try to make sense of what that experience is like. So even though there's a strong cultural imperative to genuflect towards service members, there is at the same time a significant difference in experience between those who have served and the many more who have not. And there's also a large and not necessarily helpful silence around what the experience of service is like. In this episode of The Detour, as war rages on other continents and the United States navigates the involvement of U.S. service members in these violent conflicts, We wanted to consider the experience not just of serving in the military, but specifically the experience of serving in the armed forces during wartime. We wanted to explore the experience of preparing for war, being at war, and coming back home to Oregon from war. In this episode, you'll hear from Carl Morlantes and Sean Davis, two Oregon veterans who write and speak in thoughtful, candid, and moving ways about their experiences of war and challenges coming home. What's especially interesting about Carl and Sean, who differ on plenty of specifics, is that although they're both known in some sense for their military service, they're also both powerfully critical of how this country prepares and supports the people who fight on its behalf. Sean and Carl both speak about the burden of war and how all of us in this country, not only service members, might shoulder and share this burden differently. Carl Marlantes is an author and Vietnam War veteran who grew up in Seaside, Oregon, and now lives in rural Washington. He's written books including Matterhorn, a novel of the Vietnam War, and What It Is Like to Go to War, as well as the 2021 novel Deep River, about logging, labor, and family in the Pacific Northwest. If you haven't yet read Matterhorn or Carl's other books, well, you should. Our conversation with Carl is from all the way back in 2013, And although the conversation took place nearly 10 years ago, it brings up ideas that are deeply resonant in this moment. This conversation between Carl, Cameron Smith, who was then the head of Oregon's Department of Veterans Affairs, and John Fronmeyer, at that time the board chair of Oregon Humanities, was part of our Think and Drink series on the theme, How to Love America, and was recorded in front of a live audience at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. On my right, your left, is Carl Marlantes, who is a native Oregonian, grew up in the, the uh, northwest Oregon coast. As Marines, uh, you, I think, necessarily were volunteers. And so I would be interested in hearing, um, knowing that Marines are fighting, um, uh, fighting outfits, why would you volunteer? It, it's really interesting because I grew up in a very different era. Virtually everybody, and I grew up in Seaside, and uh, virtually every adult in town was, was either in World War II or was married to someone who was in World War II. Uh, and uh, you, you sort of had this sense of, of that people sort of served their country. There was also something called the draft. And that was always hanging over the heads of the boys. And it was like, you know, nobody really, you know, th- thought, yippee, I'm going to get drafted. But you also had this sense that, well, you know, if you get drafted, you sort of, it's like paying your income taxes. You sort of owe your country. You know, I mean, that was the feeling. You know, it's like, well, okay, I got, I got drafted and I got to give them two years. And uh, so, so that, that was the sort of the zeitgeist be, behind the, the thinking, which has changed a lot today. And then you get down to the, my, my specific things. There's some funny reasons and some not so funny reasons. But uh, so I thought, well, if I'm going to 
if I have the chance of getting drafted, I'd rather serve in some other outfit, maybe than the army. And 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 uh, all the guys on the on the football team were going down to San Diego and joining something called the Marine Corps. And they would come back with something that I'd never seen before called a suntan. <laughs> and their shoulders were about four inches wider, and they were sort of lean as whips. And, uh, you know, I'm an 18-year-old kid, and I'm going, I want some of that. Yeah. I want some of that. And uh, so that was, that was why I joined the Marines. But I have to tell you one funny story, and, and it's... Uh, so I asked the Marine recruiter. I mean, I knew about what Marines did, Iwo Jima and John Wayne and all that stuff. I said, but, you know, what else do they do? And he looks at me and he says, well, we guard embassies. I said, really? Like in Paris? He said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the nature of sacrifice, uh, what Abraham Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion for those who are actually killed. But I'd like you to talk about it, not just in terms of you who were on the ground uh, facing the, the mortality issue, but the rest of us in society uh, who are there uh, at home and maybe pretty comfortable. Yeah, I think that when I was most afraid was just before an operation. I mean, I'd watch the helicopters coming in and I'd go like, there's no way out. I'm going to have to get on that bird, and then when the door opens, it's going to be fire, you know. And so, but once the door opened, then it was like, it, it's like this this thing about the unit. I mean, there was certainly no thoughts about, you know, I'm doing this for America or anything of the sort. It's like, I got to get these kids out someplace where we can get into a, the, the right kind of perimeter, and I've got to get the artillery called in, and I've got to, and you suddenly just start operating to try and keep your unit, basically people you really do love, from getting killed. That's It, it comes down to real basic stuff. And uh, the fear kind of goes, you know, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, you're just completely pumped full of adrenaline. I mean, it's just, you just, you can't, like I say, it's, it, it, to try to explain to people, it's like the, the most enormous high you can imagine, but it's like crack cocaine. The costs of that high are extreme, so you really don't want to do it. But that's what happens, at least that's what my experience was. What sense, if, if any, did you have about the fact, um, well, particularly during the Iraq wars, uh, that, uh, you know, the wars were, quote, off budget, um, and we back home were affected by them almost not at all. Uh, and then, of course, during the Vietnam War, the, the whole society was in turmoil over, over that. So did that affect you as, as military people? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, certainly the Vietnam experience was uh, horrible uh, because you'd get, I mean, I mean, guys would get letters from former girlfriends saying they don't want to see them anymore because they're, you know, baby-killing bastards. And, I mean, you would really get hateful mail from politi politically activated people that used to be sort of, you know, something that you wanted to date. And... Uh, um, <laughs> And, and, and so it was, it was really difficult. And I, I always say to people, I said, you know, it, it, there is a bind that civilians face about supporting the wars, which is that, you know, um, well, I support the troops, but I don't support the war. You have to accept responsibility that you can't do it. Because the fact of the matter is, if there's some 19-year-old out there and he knows that somebody back home says this is a really stupid war, it's going to hurt his morale. And the other thing is, is if the people on the opposite side say, if we just wait it out long enough, the American people are going to get tired of this and they're going to go away. That's going to hurt, too. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't protest the wars. But what I'm saying is that you can't just be in la-la land and say, oh, I, I support the troops. But I, you have to accept the responsibility that what you're doing is very problematical in the sense of its impact on these young kids that are fighting. Uh, do it anyway, but don't kid yourself. I think that we have to really think about who we are and if we are a republic. Um, I was at a book reading outside of uh, um, Fort Bragg in North Carolina, and a young couple came up to me, and, and you know they look like they're about three years out of high school, and she's got a baby in her left arm, and she's hauling a toddler like this. And uh, she starts crying, 
And uh, I know what's the matter. You know, if I can get her, and she points to her husband and she says, well, he's shipping out again tomorrow. And I turn to this kid and I say, wow, your second tour. He says, no, sir, my seventh. You know, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves, basically. And, and I think that, that it's, it's problematical because we are getting to the point where we're sort of hiring it out. And you can't hire out killing. I mean, you can hire out, you know, lots of things, but that one's immoral. You, it, it's got to be an action by the state performed by people who are employed by the state. And I, and I think that uh, we, we have a problem with that. And if I can just go on one more thing, it's, just, it's so unfair. One half of one percent of this company. I think it's just unfair. Um, seven southern states supply of half of the military. And the worst trend is that if you take the lower three deciles in terms of income from, you know, where kids are raised and compare to the top three, in World War II, the lower three died at 1.2 times the rate of the top three. Now, that's perfectly understandable. It's not just, but, I mean, the kids that can type and read and get, get jobs in the rear, okay, and, and the ones that can't end up in the, in the front fighting. In Vietnam, it went up to 1.4 times or 1.45 times. Today, it is 1.65 times. That's a very bad trend. I mean, that's something that a republic needs to think about. I mean, we're putting the load really on a, on a class. that it, it's, it, it should be a shared burden. Uh, Tom Foley, who died last week, uh, was heard to say that you can never trust anybody who hasn't done something for you. And I think that that's a pretty good argument for the draft in terms of patriotism. Well, I would, I would argue that you, you, the military doesn't want to draft everybody because you, you don't want to have people there that really don't want to be there. And it's also, I think, you've got a moral issue forcing somebody to kill somebody. But the thing is, the unfairness, I think, could be solved by national service. I don't think there's a military person on the, in the country that would feel bad if someone said, I did my two years teaching kids to read and watts. Yeah. You pulled your oar. Fabulous. Yeah. You know. Okay, so we've kind of touched on it, but um, let's go to the ethical issues of war. Um, we had the Nuremberg trials after World War II, uh, and yet, uh, during the second Bush administration, John, you uh, termed the uh, Geneva Accords as quaint. Uh, so where are we in terms of rules of war uh, in an ethical sense? Well, I, I mean, uh, you know, I think that, that there's a lot of this sort of tough guy talk about, you know, well, you know, there's, there's no rules to war. And I think that that is wrong. I think that what you're... What you're really trying to do with your military is you're trying to stop somebody from hurting your people. If you're not stopping someone from hurting your people, what are you doing? All right. So how do you stop someone from hurting your people? Sometimes you have to use violence to stop the violence. So I, I, I think that there is that's my my position on the on the ultimate ethics of it is that uh, you, you've got to make sure that the people are committed to something that actually makes ethical sense in the first place, which is we're threatened and I think we should fight back. You know, I'm not a I'm not anti-war. I, I am anti-stupid war, but I'm not anti-war. <laughs> There's a, there's a scene in Darwin Mailer's The Naked and the Dead where they have captured a Japanese prisoner and the, the sergeant that's in charge gives him cigarettes and they treat him nicely and then he shoots him. Um, what, what kind of rules uh, were meaningful when you were actually in combat? Well, one of the problems is that, that the rules get bent and... Uh, the, the the rule, the golden rule, applies even there. If you were taken prisoner, would you, you would certainly want someone to be treat you nicely and then not kill you. So that is an immoral act, and you certainly know that if you're if you're engaged in in warfare, that uh, the other guy is going to try to kill you. But you've agreed in a way to put yourself in that situation. I mean, you, there are a thousand and one ways to get out of fighting. I mean, you have to deal with the. Uh, 
uh, being called a coward, but you, you know you can do it. It's not hard. It just you just walk out. I mean, no one's going to you know stop you. So you have sort of an agreement about it, and and I think that you still have this idea of the golden rule. And the, and the other one is that I think this sort of tough guy sort of you know there's no holds barred is wrong. If you think about military organizations, they in some ways are the epitome of civilization because they are the ones that are completely armed can do all the damage in the world, and they are the ones that have to be the most under their own control. And how else are they controlled except by their own ethical standards? Um, and it, you, you just think that, that uh, uh, somehow war excuses you from that. It doesn't. And I think that there's many examples where people have fallen, fallen short, but we all fall short. We all do things in business or in politics that we don't, don't feel particularly good about. We're human. Let, let me just follow up on that, Carl, because in uh, one of your books you talk about red heat, white heat. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, do you want to explain? Yeah, it, it's sort of a way I, I, I talk about it, uh, uh, how you get into atrocities. And um, I, I call it, the, the, there's sort of the red heat atrocity is the one where you finally have gotten to a point, you've been so battered in combat that you you actually just become enraged or you just you just you're seeing blood and that's why I call it red heat and it's a it's it's a very difficult situation to uh, uh, try and check and try and control and um, I call it white heat when you get just so steely cold that you're just your mind is no longer has any sense of compassion it is completely like a like a computer, what are the odds that someone's going to hurt me? If it's one-tenth of a millionth of a percent, why take the chance? Just kill him. Because, you know, if, if, if he really isn't surrendering, well, then I can get killed. But So if you're in that white heat stance where you're just calculating, well, the calculation is, why would you take a chance? It's an infinite loss if you die. Um, Behind all these is something that I think we really need to understand and we, we really need to teach all the people who are going to do fighting for us is this idea of what I call pseudo-speciation, which is we all know uh, the words, you know, kraut, gook, jap, nip, towelhead, haji, you name them, we got lots of them. And what that is, is it, you know, the more politically correct say, well, that's awful, you're dehumanizing the enemy. And I'm going like, yes. How else was a, is a 19-year-old going to kill somebody uh, when he's been raised all his life, thou shalt not kill, and he's a decent kid, and he shouldn't do it? The only way he's going to pull the trigger is to dehumanize the enemy. The problem is, after he's done it and the battle's over, are they humans again, or are they still animals? But if you stay in that state, that's when the atrocities really start to happen. What about the role of of literature, of poetry, of song in war, Uh, both, you know, while it's going on and then obviously afterwards in the healing process? You know, there's a a wonderful, I think it's a Hopi uh, myth about the two brothers who go to the sun and they're warriors. And uh, when they come back, they've been in the war mode and there's lightning coming out of their heads and smoke coming out of their mouths and everybody in the village is scared to death of them and uh, uh, Spider Woman comes out and uh, gets them to start singing and all that starts to go back down Mm -hmm. and then after they've sung what they've done they are actually then able to once again reintegrate with the community they're no longer in that fearful frightful mode and, and I think that the arts are, are singing in the terms of what veterans can do with it. But I think there's another function that's really important, which is particularly with literature. I mean, if you read history about wars, it's like, okay, you know, this was caused by this, and then this unit went here, and then here's the casualties. You, yeah, you learn something, but you don't get it. The, the thing about literature is, is that we are... We are sort of, we have to live inside of our skins. I have no idea what your life is like or how you see the world. I can't get there. It's just the way we are built. But literature is actually a way around that, and it's called identifying with a character. 
Mm-hmm. And if you have great literature with great characters, people can actually get out of their own skins and begin to see the world through the eyes of that character. And in the case of war, there are, there are novels, start, you know, Tolstoy on, that actually get you into the, uh, into the skin of those characters. And you're no longer here. You're no longer your age, your sex, your social class. You are that person. And then you really do get as close of, to an experience of war as I think is possible without doing it. Let's talk about the cost of war. One estimate of the Iraq war is $6 trillion dollars. Um, talking about opportunity cost of what $6 trillion could do in some other way. And, of course, the personal cost, uh, not just the dead and the, and the wounded, but probably the maybe, what, quarter to a half a million that have PTSD. What about that? Well, just doing the math, uh, 6,000 U.S. cities could get a billion dollars. That would probably help their budgets. <laughs> you know, it's a massive number. Yeah. And the, the issue of, of the, the true cost of war, which is, not, which is certainly the, the dead and the maimed, but it's also the families of those people, and it, and it goes on for generations. I think that we, we, we don't reckon those costs. They're, you know, this one's off budget. And, and, but the thing is you don't count the cost that's going to go on for another 70 or 80 years. And I think that you just, you just need to, to uh, reckon those costs. And there are times, as I said, I'm not a pacifist. There are times when you say, I'm going to have to pay for this because there are certain values that I hold uh, that are worth it. You know, and, and if, in fact, we were, if our life, way of life and our freedoms and, and our, our ideas about equality and, and the many things that we've struggled with and fought over for centuries are threatened, Six trillion dollars is nothing. But if it's not for that, then six trillion dollars is a whole lot of wasted money. Carl, you have described uh, combat as a spiritual experience. What did you mean by that? Well, what I meant by that was that when you're dealing with death, you are dealing in the realm of the spirit. You cannot deal with the death, which is actually something that only the gods should deal with, taking human life, deciding who dies or who doesn't die. That's something that is really should be beyond human capability. It is in the realm of spirit. And so when you put somebody into those situations, if you don't recognize that you have put them into a situation of the spirit and then they're going to get messed up because there are wounds to the soul, not just the body. And, and so starting to think about it that way is the first step. The second one, which I talk about the actual experience of combat, is that if you think about the experience of mystics, they are constantly aware of their own death. You know, Don Juan, death is over your shoulder. They... Um, Strive through incredible psychophysical exercises to be in the present moment. They are part of a, of a group, you know, the sangha, the, the church, the convent. Um, and they lose their egos in, in, and become less ego-bound and more oriented toward the other. Every one of those things is, is there in combat. Now, whether you can just say, well, it's the equivalent experience or it's the same experience, my own opinion is that it's the opposite side of the coin. We, we in America, you know, I, mean, I had an Indian, I used to work in India, and one of the Indian managers, after we had several beers at the Bengal Club, was, uh, he said, you know, you Americans are the only people on the planet that, that think that death's an option. <laughs> And our religion is, is sort of that way. I mean, it's like we love Christmas, but we don't like Good Friday, all right? But, but you know, the Aztecs did ritual torture. The Iroquois did ritual torture. The, the Buddhists have monsters guarding the gates. I mean, other world religions have enormously dark sides to them. We don't like that. And so I think that, that perhaps in this world of opposites, of yin and yang, that you're just seeing the, the opposite spiritual experience.
Sean Davis is a writer, teacher, artist, and Iraq War veteran who lives in Astoria, Oregon. He used to lead American Legion Post 134 in Northeast Portland. And in that role, he also led a number of coming home programs, gatherings of military veterans and family members to read, write, and think together. Sean, who wrote The Wax Bullet War, has also lived in rural central Oregon, where he convened people to reckon with wildfires. He's also been a wildland firefighter. In 2016, Sean ran an inspiring campaign for mayor of Portland. He's been a partner and friend to Oregon Humanities for many years, and I was fortunate to speak with Sean over the phone in April 2022 at the X-Ray Studios in Portland, Oregon. Hey there, this is Adam Davis with The Detour from Oregon Humanities. I'm happy to be on the phone here with Sean Davis in Astoria. And Sean, uh, maybe for starters, I just wanted to ask you to say hello, and could you maybe Tell me how you ended up getting involved with the military and where you did your service. Oh, of course. You know, I joined the military. It was kind of an economic draft, as uh, many people. You know, I lived in a very small town in rural Oregon up in the mountains. And um, I didn't see a whole lot of options. And it was the first Gulf War that was happening, and they were taking everybody. I'm not even supposed to, I wasn't supposed to be in the infantry because I'm colorblind, mm. but because of the Gulf War, the doctor's like, do this, and he made his finger go back and forth, uh-huh. and I'm like, what's this? Is a trigger finger? And and I did it. He's like, all right, you're good. <laughs> and that was it. And then I was left in the, I was left in the military, so I went to uh, um, active duty Army uh, infantry from April 5th 1993. So yesterday would have been 29 mm-hmm. years since I first signed up uh, until January of uh, 31st, 1999. And I got out of the military. And then, of course, uh, the day after Sept- September 11th, I uh, reenlisted into the Oregon National Guard, uh, which is a little different than active uh, regular army. And then I stayed in for six years and went to Iraq during that time. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting to think about the two different periods, and it sounds like the first one, even as you think about it now, starting in 93, was driven more by your sense of economic necessity, and the second, so, one, was, second one was driven by something else, it sounds like. What, like. How do you think about the different reasons for why you went the first time and the second time? Well, doing six years pre- 9-11, and then six years post 9-11. Uh, yeah, it was completely two different militaries. Um, yeah, the first time I joined up, I just didn't feel like I had another option if I wanted to go to school or buy a house. And I learned a lot. Uh, I did a, a lot about um, selfless service, a lot about discipline. Um, but I also didn't like the military experience too much. We went to Haiti in 95, and it had been such such a long time since we had a conflict that the officers that in the higher enlisted were jumping out of the plane that day. We were out in the in the in the hills of Les Kais trying to get get in trouble a little bit so they can get their coveted combat infantry badge and turn this into a war. And they'd like, or or just get awards for doing something, anything. Mm-hmm. All we've had at that point uh, that that I, the people that I was serving with was Granada. And that was a while ago. So they're itching to get into a fight. And, um, and then when September 11th happened, and even when we were going to Iraq, uh, we did a, like a six month train up in Texas during that time, it was kind of like that again, you know, but then the years after the war had started, there was definitely that, that, that fatigue that set in, People didn't want to go to war anymore. You know, I, we we've glorified war since we've started writing stories or cave paintings and in, in, in you know motion pictures so much that you know I grew up with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Rambo and, and you know Jean Claude Van Damme and and then you know patriotism was in the beer commercials and so yeah you know I did join at first because. I needed a way out of my small town, but there was a belief that I was doing something great and uh, greater than myself in this world. Going to Iraq, it only took like a month before I understood, you know, I can't speak for others. 
I thought there'd be a great plan to spread and maintain democracy. And, and I didn't see that anyone had a plan and I didn't really know what the heck we were doing there. Mm-hmm. I think there's going to, there is right now. I mean, I know with myself, but people that I serve with, there's a great disillusionment that like, what the hell did my friends die for mm-hmm. in Iraq? I don't know what that was about. Um, we were there for each other is what we say, but I don't see why they sent some of our, our best and brightest to, you know, 7,000 miles to go die in a desert. I don't know what we accomplished. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot in what you just started to say there, including losing friends and people you care deeply about. Um, you also said early in your comments that you didn't really like the experience the first time, which sounded like you were going to contrast it with going after 9-11. And so maybe I just want to slow it down a little bit and ask, you said you you learned some, you learned about selfless service, discipline, but you didn't really like it. And I just want to ask, what didn't you like and how did that sit alongside things like discipline and selfless service? Well, I was enlisted, uh, not an officer. You know, I I made myself up from the ranks from private. And you have to understand, so the the 10 years that I, the first 10 years that I was in both, um, both enlistments, I did make it up to E7, which is a platoon sergeant, and that's pretty fast, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first six years I was in, I got up to um, I was up to E5, which was a non uh, a non commissioned officer. I was in charge of people, and when you get to the point where you're in charge of people, it gets better. But there is a real sense of you know I'm here in the military fighting for other people's rights, and I have none. I am government property. Mm-hmm. And they had to tell you where you're going to live. They had to tell you like what you could do. Um, you, you really don't have a whole lot of choices and a lot of stuff. And, and so you're fighting for, you know, the land of the free, but you really don't have the freedoms that everyone else does. And that was really hard to deal with, at least in my time, in my first tour. And I, I know a lot of other people had that um, same uh, attitude, but that, they tell you like, you got to reenlist. If you don't, then you're going to get out. You're not going to find a job. You'll just end up back in here. You know, and, And there is a certain sense of um, institutionalization. You know, you're there every day and and you only really have two missions when you're in. Take care of your guys and complete the mission. And and then when you get out, you have to deal with rent and relationships and everything else. So, um, but you kind of want that freedom that you don't get when you're in. And then when you get out, you're like, well, you know, I think I had to, get out for a while and look at it because there were a lot of benefits that the U S government gave me for being in the, in the military. And, um, I might not have seen them, you know, when I was in it and then being out. But the second time I joined, I'd, I'd love for the first couple of years, I love to tell people I was so patriotic that I joined the day after nine 11 and, and to a certain sense. Yes, maybe. But the, looking at it years later, I think one of the biggest reasons I joined is because I just didn't have excitement in my life. And I knew what, you know, I knew that something was going to happen. I also knew that there was going to be a knee jerk reaction against a certain population of, of U.S. citizens, you know, Iraqis and Middle Eastern people. And um, I wanted to be in the military so I can help deal with that in a way. From within, but honestly, I didn't think that I'd be sent to Iraq, you know, because I was regular army, and that's who they send to war. I thought, well, I'm going to join the Oregon National Guard and do my part here in Oregon and help out. And then, you know, a year and a half later, I'm in Iraq. <laughs> and and uh, how did that feel when you got the news that you're going over? It was, yeah, it was scary. I mean, we were ready, but. I don't know if people thought we were ready. So they had us do a six month train up in um, Fort Hood, Texas, and then do one month in um, Fort Polk, Louisiana to make sure we're ready. So they're all looking at us. We, we got fast rope train. That's what the, the guys in uh, Black Hawk down did. Right. So you just, you're hovering in a helicopter. They throw ropes down. You got some thick leather gloves. You go down that rope. That's the stuff that we did. I mean, we did some pretty high speed stuff. What did it mean to be ready? Yeah. Well, it would be, be able to do the job. You know, um, like I said, National Guard were thought of as weekend warriors. 
that maybe weren't the soldiers that we they needed to go serve. Uh, we showed them that uh, we definitely were. Not only did we were at the level that you needed to go, we were above that level. And so they started giving us, you know, higher and more specific training to do different things yeah, while we were in, when we got to, to theater in Iraq. You said a few minutes ago that one of the reasons you wanted to re-enlist was that you had a sense that uh, there might be some things that weren't going to be so great, and you wanted to be able to affect that by being over there, if I heard you right. Uh, were, right. Were you, well, how did that shake first out? First off, I, well, I thought I'd, you know, I would be effective here in Oregon to, against any anti you know, uh, Middle Eastern sentiment with, with the people who live here. Um, but going to Iraq, so you have to understand when I went to Haiti, I was just a private and I didn't know anything. I didn't know what language they spoke. I had no idea they were, you know, speaking Creole or French. I didn't know their religion or anything. I knew just enough to fear everybody there because they looked so different than me. So when we went to Haiti, uh, it was terrifying for me. When we When they told us that we were going to Iraq, I took it upon myself to make sure that my people that are underneath me were not going to be terrified like that. So I started learning Arabic. I read about, I read the Quran and I read about the mandate system that just kind of chopped the Middle East in pieces and just kind of assigned them governments and about all their history. The first, one of the first things I did is I went to the bookstore and I bought a complete idiot's guide to Iraq and people made fun of me for carrying that around and reading it while I was (laughs) on the drill floor. But at the end of the day, they all wanted to know what was in there because uh-huh. no one had really even heard that country before. And so when we would go to chow hall, I would stand in the, in the, in the front of the chow line. And if my guys didn't know the word of the day for that day, they had to go to the end of the line. Nice. My platoon sergeant saw me do that. So he did it for the platoon. And pretty much pretty soon I was doing it for the whole battalion. Mm-hmm. So they, we had to make sure that they knew how to say hello, thank you. You know, what's in the bag? Where where are the bad guys? And stuff like that, you know. But that wasn't so, part of that wasn't part no. of uh institutional preparation or readiness. That was something Not that you at had to all. No. no, it maybe the, the squad leaders got a little uh booklet that gave you um, Iraqi phrases, but a lot of those Iraqi phrases weren't even the phrases they used in Iraq, is uh, maybe Egyptian, you know. So I had to find which dialect they're they're using and try to learn that way for when i was over there we didn't even have translators they used me as a translator and i I spoke as well as maybe a four-year-old child Hmm. it was pretty insane it sounds your word was insane it sounds really challenging especially because you went for principled reasons uh, and you wanted to have a different experience of where you were than it sounds like you had when you went over to Haiti and you talked about fear. Did you feel fear of the people you ended up among broadly? Oh, I was, I was, I was afraid every day. And, and I'll admit that, you know, my, the guys in my squad or my platoon is like, you didn't seem like you're scared. You're like, well, I was in charge. I, I couldn't show it. But of course, because the people that we were there sent there to protect looked exactly like the people who were shooting at us and mortaring us and blowing us up with IEDs every day. And in some cases, they were the same people. And it's really not their fault. Their entire economy collapsed. And so if they get somebody who knocks on the door and says, all I need you to do is dig a hole and I'll give you $5, um, you don't have to do anything else. If you don't, then I'm going to hurt you or your family. You're going to dig a hole. And then the next family like all what i need you to do is drop this in the hole and the next one is just bury the hole you know they're not Mm -hmm. out there doing it to uh, you know there were people that were upset at us because like an accident will happen and a family member will die because there were a huge bureaucracy or a huge just the logistics of um so many military personnel coming into a war-torn country uh, you know, uh, a convoy will run over a child and kill it, or will try to mortar some bad guys and accidentally kill their livestock, which they depend on. And so in, in a certain way, sometimes we were creating our own enemies while we we're there. And, and so you would get people that are upset at us and try to shoot at us and we'd shoot back at them and kill them. And then their friends and brothers and cousins 
uh, become more bad guys. And that it was the people that we were fighting, at least. Like I said, you go over there and you think, okay, I have an idea of war because you know, I, I watched movies or I read books, and I'm supposed to be fighting these guys that are wearing a certain uh, uniform, and we have different ideals. And then you get there, and no one's wearing any uniforms. <laughs> you don't know anybody's ideology. And not only that, but now throw like a dozen war orphans, you know, babies without parents in on the combat, on the battlefield. And, and every town you go into, people are sniping at you and you, you, you don't know why, you know, it was insane. It was, it was, it was insanity. I didn't see in my, from my perspective of being over there, a way out or, or even a reason for, you know, I think we're trying to, to to turn the power back on. We had to keep people from price gouging gasoline. And um, so we did certain things, but like the kids, some, a lot of the kids that we helped um, get out of bad situations would just join the Iraqi police and get killed. Or, um, you know, you drive to your favorite pizza shop. We did this one time. We're going to the green zone. I love this pizza shop. I go, it's a smoking crater, you know, and no one really tells you why that happened. And that was really difficult. So it's interesting because you're, you're talking both about the experience itself and the reasons for the experience. And it sounds like there was a good degree of difficulty to understate it uh, with both. Can I, I want to ask you just a little bit more about the experience itself, even leaving the reasons aside for a minute. Uh, do you remember when you were first shot at or when you first shot at someone else? Well, the first day that we were in Taji, um, we got mortared. And about, I don't know, maybe 250 feet away from us, there was an explosion. And we were brushing our teeth and, and stuff. And, and I thought, I'm like, what the heck? They're doing demolition over there. They're probably, you know, blowing up to put a road or something. Mm -hmm. And then another mortar landed closer to us. And I'm like, okay, that was weird. And then a the third one, you can hear the whistling of the mortar mm -hmm. turning as it's coming through the, the air. And so at that point, we're like, somebody's trying to kill us. And my, my very first thought was, I don't know why they would want to kill me. <laughs> they don't know me at all. Like, why are they doing this? You know, I took it personal. And uh, <laughs> so that was uh, really, really difficult to figure out. But, you know, you snap into it because you're training and all of a sudden you're doing everything. The first time that really uh, struck me was we got mortared one day and my unit was the first one to go to a, somebody, a new unit had a platoon formation outside for accountability. And one of the mortars, enemy mortars landed in their, in their formation and it killed three people and it wounded like 30 people. And we're there trying to triage and figure it out. And then we had been mortared so many times uh, for the first couple of months we were there. Uh, the colonel's like, you guys go out and find these guys. And so we went to a Baptist town and we just through force right? and, and i mean i don't i'm not there weren't any war crimes we were aggressive violent and angry and we finally found uh one of the guys that he was a cousin and he escaped through this one route and we had found him and um that we had leads for another one and so i was left with this guy uh he had his hands tied behind his back he's on his knees and with a gag and I, that morning, I was with the people who he killed and, and the people in pain because of this man. And I wanted to kill him really badly, <laughs> but I didn't, but I really did. And I think I, you know, I was alone with this guy. My, my, my guys were cleaning out a house or my, my squad. I could have killed him. I really could have. I don't think there would have been repercussions. It's harder to to not kill sometimes. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. Can I ask why you didn't? I I think about that. I don't know. I, I so badly wanted to. I just there's social norms. You're not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Mm. I, I just think that I was trying to hold on to what, you, you know, um, when you're going through your drills, you're, um, you're doing, you know, you're working it to muscle memory. So, so you hear somebody shooting at you, your arms are up and you're shooting back already. You're really trying to get rid of the, the part in your head that tells you not to do these things that we are told you can't do in society. That's why the pop-up targets are shaped like they Well, when I first got it, were shaped like Russians with a big mm-hmm. red star on the mm-hmm. probably are now again, but uh, so the pop-up targets look like silhouettes of Russian soldiers, you know, and, and you we're doing ready ups and we're shooting all the time and we're trying to, to kind of squash the, 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 I wouldn't say the decent part because that job needs to be done so badly, but the, the more human part of it just to be the soldier. And I didn't want, I wasn't ready just to give, give that person up, mm-hmm. you know, I wanted to make sure that, uh, because that, that's why I joined in the first place. I thought maybe I can make a difference. And I think if you know other people were there, we just could have blew his brains all over the the, mm-hmm. the wall and moved on, and mm-hmm. we wouldn't have had to deal with it. But uh, I, I think the guys that I was with, I don't think any of them would have killed him either. I think they were really great people. So. Mm-hmm. But we were really angry. I mean, you see the people that he killed, and you and you want that mm-hmm. revenge. You know, it sounds. Uh incredibly psychologically challenging to on the one hand be there and to be trained to be ready to kill uh, to not know where the threat is coming from and also to have sort of deep human impulses not to do one of the things that you're there to do I mean how do you think about now even from a little distance how do you think about how all that goes together? I honestly try not to think about it. I mean, I have, you know, the VA gives me pills for nightmares. Mm-hmm. I, I have um, a lot of issues with all this stuff. And, and at first I thought it was because I was being weak. You know, mm-hmm. I, it's hard to admit that, uh, you know, we were, we were, we had to do a lot of stuff that you shouldn't do, uh, like regular people in society shouldn't do, you know, um, I don't know, you know, when I think about it, it comes out when I write, you know, a lot, but um, I try not to think about it. You you said you you write a lot, and I know that from some work that Oregon Humanities was lucky to get to support that you've been doing, and I've read your stuff, and writing seems like one of the ways that you've come home and adjusted to coming home. But can I ask you a little bit about uh, either how writing has fit in or just how coming home has worked for you? What's it been like to come home from this experience where, to put it again starkly, you talked about brushing your teeth. And, you know, there's brushing your teeth in your bathroom at home and there's brushing your teeth while mortar's getting closer and closer to you. How do you adjust back? It's tough. Uh People ask me, like, what's war like? And I'll tell them, well, it, it smelled like diesel fumes. It tasted like cold coffee. And it was very, very boring until it very much wasn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what it was. Uh, if I'm next to a truck idling and it's a diesel truck, I'm right back there in the desert, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it's it, And I'm hyper vigilant, and everybody around me is a threat. If something that I see kind of triggers me and I'm in a restaurant, I count all the people in that restaurant and then I prioritize which one I'd have to take out first. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not a pleasant way to live, you know, but there's really, it's impossible not to be like that. Um, art is really saved my life. I, you know, yes, I definitely did the writing. I wrote a whole memoir called the wax bullet war. Mm-hmm. And, and that was a good, uh, and I went across the country and I did a, a book tour with it and talking to complete strangers about the worst times of my life. Mm-hmm. And somehow that was cathartic, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know. but I, uh, you know, I also paint and I, I illustrate, um, I helped out with an opera that was put on downtown Portland about war, you know, as a, um, I do. Uh, I try to, to 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 do as many mediums as I can, and I art without art, you know, because coming home and and I always say PTSD is like so. If 
you have a spinal injury and you have to learn how to use your legs to walk again. PTSD is you break your emotions and they're not working right. Mm -hmm. And you try to use them for something and all of a sudden um, something else happens. It's like your anger is like trying to balance an orange on a toothpick. Mm -hmm. And when it falls, it just comes out. And you have to try to figure out how to use all that stuff again. And it's so difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Um, You have to, for me, art is what helped me and saved me for that. That and having routines. I need to have routines or else I, I, if I get outside my routine, it's tough for me. You know, mm-hmm. I want to ask you a little bit about the extent to which you feel a kind of unique bond with other service members. Like, is that, do you feel like there's an experience yeah. that, and I haven't served, so I'm coming from outside and my questions are, based in large part in ignorance. Um, w- well, I don't think anybody else has really asked me that before. And, and I'll tell you, I don't think I have a unique bond with all the other service members mm-hmm. because um, just like any other population, there are some assholes that, mm-hmm. who are veterans. You know, um, There are a lot of people who have completely different political ideology than I do and, and, and don't believe in climate change or... In fact, that that's kind of like the default in a lot of uh, the military is more of a conservative uh, type person. I think my special bond is, and this is what I had to learn, was people who experienced trauma like mm. I like I did and lived through it. And it doesn't have to be a combat veteran, you know. So, I think I want to. I think I want to ask you if you feel like you have an open question or two when you think about. Uh, where the military sits in our culture or where it sits for you. Are there any persistent questions for you that come up? So if, if, so I've said that there's a huge untapped resource in our communities and that's our combat veterans. And if I were going to talk to politicians, which, which I have talked to some, if they want to tap that, that, that resource, um, I would say start something like the civilian conservation Corps for, for combat veterans or, or just veterans getting out because I would say most of the people, if not all, they join trying because they wanted to make a bigger difference in their, in their community, make our country a better country. We're not doing that by, by going, being sent off to wars that, that don't have, I mean, we are ready to do an incredible difficult job. We understand that when we sign up. But make it make the the sacrifice or the, or the hard work that we put into it worthwhile, you know. Mm-hmm. So if we can do something like fund the American Legion to do things in the communities, mm-hmm. we tried to do that here with the Veterans Lottery Bill Fund. We put a bill together and we were asking for five percent of the the lottery funds to go towards veterans issues, and for a certain extent, it, it worked. We only got 1.5% after a couple of years of lobbying for it, but that money went into creating veteran service officers to help combat veterans get a higher disability rating. And while I believe that is definitely something that needs to happen because, you know, they, they should be able to live comfortably after they come back and not have to worry about money and everything. But what we're doing essentially is we're taking that money and we're betting on our veterans' disabilities. Mm-hmm. They're saying, so every $1 that we put in as a state to hire a VSO, we're getting $10 of federal money back in the form of that disability check. What we should be doing is helping out with disabilities for sure. But what we should be doing, instead of betting on our veterans' disabilities, we should be betting on their capabilities Mm -hmm. and creating programs for them to give back into the community because they want to. And not only will they do a great job, but it'll help them in, in their mindset uh, to be able to, to be important again yeah. and, and, and make the country better. I think your presence at the American Legion, uh, the way you're integrating your military service and your art and your community work, your firefighting, uh, like all this stuff that you model by your own commitment, uh, it sets a high bar, and I just really want to express uh, my appreciation to you for all of that work and the ways you show up for the community. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. 
You can find links to our guests' work and photos of their time on tour on our website, oregonhumanities.org, where you'll also find suggested readings related to today's show picked by Oregon Humanities staff, as well as our calendar of events. We'd love to see you in person for a conversation project, consider this event, or other program. You can support the show by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts or by sharing it with a friend. We'd be really grateful. And before we sign off, please consider telling us about your experience with war or how a relationship with someone who has been to war shaped your view on it by emailing us at thedetour at oregonhumanities.org. While you're there, let us know what else you want to hear on the show and what you think of the show. The Detour is made possible by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm Adam Davis. Kieran Bond is our producer. Our editor and engineer is Dave Friedlander. Our assistant producers are Alexandra Powell Bugden, Karina Brisky, and Ben Waterhouse. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.